and it's just thrilling to be into this book just a little bit in in review the apostle paul remembers in prison when he uh, met epaphras a fellow prisoner who told him about the colossian church the church at colossi and uh, he told them that they were mostly gentiles but like the galatians they were in trouble they were in trouble over the fact of whether they should worship angels and follow Jewish customs. Oh, that there is nothing that can wreck a church quicker than to have somebody come in with some false doctrine. This is what the Apostle Paul, when he warned the Ephesian elders, he said, I cease not to warn you day and night for three years, because after I leave, he says, they're not only going to come in from the outside, but there'll be some people come in from the inside. And usually, you know how you can detect them? They're a little more spiritual than you are. That's right, they're a little more spiritual than you are. The first thing you know, you'll get invited to, I mean, they think they are. Uh, you'll get invited to uh, maybe a little Bible study in their home. And uh, a lot of times it's conducted by a woman. Or a woman's got a man conducting it and she's behind here uh, engineering it but uh, this is where these starts and uh, these Bible studies in homes we need to be careful of so many cults have come out of them this is why the Word of God tells us about assembling ourselves together and so much the more as we see the time of the approaching of the Lord and so uh, the early church the minute the, some of these Gentiles got saved the Jews came to them and said ah we're so glad you're saved, but you want to get the rest of it. You know, you haven't got it all yet. You want to get the rest of it. And so the, the Jews told him, you know, you need to be circumcised. Uh, that'll kind of put the finishing touches on. And uh, observe some of these Jewish customs. And, of course, Paul writing to the Galatians, he said, Oh, ye foolish, simple Galatians, who hath bewitched you or cast a spell over you? Having begun in the spirit, are now you are you now continuing on in the flesh? No. We're kept by the power of God through faith. So Epaphras told the Apostle Paul about these Christians over there and their needs. And so Paul writes to him and he establishes two or three things. Number one, in verse one, he established that he is an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And we emphasize this uh, much in an earlier message, but it's so important that you know that you're a painter or a plumber or a bricklayer or whatever you are by the will of God. You're there because that's where God has placed you now. Maybe he'll place you someplace else later. But it's important, missionary, so many missionaries have come home from the field because they weren't persuaded in their own heart that they were there by the will of God. And when things got rough, they couldn't look back and say, God, I'm here because you put me here. You see, and things got tough and they left. And, and so many husbands and wives, when you get married, you marry this person or you should marry this person because it's the will of God. You don't need any other reason. They might be the homeliest person in the world as far as the world is concerned and the most beautiful person in the world as far as God is concerned. But you need to know that it's God's will. And he's emphasizing this to these Christians here. Then he tells them, I haven't met you, but I pray for you regularly. Uh, ever since I've heard of you, I put you on my prayer list, and I'm praying for you. And then he commends them for their faith. And then in verse 9, last week, we found out that he wants them to know the will of God. He says, verse 9, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. This is so important, and it's elementary, but it's important that we know that we're in the will of God. 
Now in these verses before us today, in verse 18 we read this, that in all things he might have the preeminence. This is so important. The latter part of verse 18, that in all things, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, that he might have the preeminence. Do you know what that word means? That means above others or, or surpassing. The head table, the choice seat, the head of the line, like the Queen of England. She has a preeminence in England in all things. When you go in to meet the Queen, before you even go in to meet the Queen, you are told, instructed, how to greet her. My oldest son met the Queen Mother one time, and they had to take instructions. What they were to do, they were over there, a group of them were to meet, some, have some kind of a tea or something, and they were told how that they were to, to curtsy or to bow and, and to hold her hand, never start the conversation with the queen. She, or queen mother either, royalty, she starts the conversation. You don't ask her questions. If she wants to talk, she asks you questions. Now, you see, we're not used to that around here. A lot of children aren't used to that. Would to God they were. Uh, when you go in the home that they, you know, they, they sit there until they were asked a question, but so many of them aren't there. And you have to sit there and listen to little Junior tell about everything he did the last two weeks uh, when nobody's interested about it, really. But it, it's so important. And so the, Lord, the Bible tells us that in all things, the Lord Jesus Christ should have the preeminence. Now, with that in mind, we, we need to uh, keep some of these things in mind. The Lord Jesus Christ has been so honored by the Father that in all things, all spheres, all the time, and all eternity, he's going to have the preeminence. Now, he alone in everything and in every respect might occupy the chief place, stand first, and be preeminent. And oh, how he wants to have that place in our lives. Now, he has the preeminence. God has given him the preeminence in several areas here we'll find in this portion of Scripture, and we want to look at them. In verse 15, we find he has the preeminence in likeness. Oh, listen. Who is the image or the likeness of the invisible God? Angels are holy, and many of his people in every age have been godly people. But Christ alone is the express image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews, turn to Hebrews chapter 1, the book of Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, who being the brightness of his glory, the expressed image of his person, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, and then we find in the Gospel of John, Chapter 14, verse 9, you don't need to turn, but the Word of God says, He that has seen me, Jesus Christ speaking, he that has seen me has seen the Father. So, with all these pictures, and it amuses me because just uh, this past week, I think I read in the paper about some man that was arrested about a cult, a head of a cult, and they were... Uh, giving him, uh, uh, quizzing him, and ask him about some of these things and, and uh, who he worshiped. And he mentioned the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, do you know what he looks like? And he said, I know exactly what he looks like. He said, I've seen his picture. Well, uh, that's just about as much sense as some people have. Uh, these pictures you see are no more accurate than a picture you would draw of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're just what some person uh, how some person portrays the Lord Jesus Christ. We have no pictures that's been handed down through the ages, and uh, the Bible describes the Lord Jesus Christ at crucifixion time as one that nobody would desire. Uh, his face was so marred and bruised, and we don't see a picture like that at all. So the Lord Jesus Christ has, already has, the preeminence in his likeness. And then in the latter part of verse 15, we find that he has the, lat uh, the preeminence in his birth. Notice, who is the image or the likeness 
of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. In Revelation chapter 21, turn. You, you need to see this verse. The Lord Jesus Christ speaking here, speaking. Revelation chapter 21, verse 6. And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. The first. Alpha means first. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the, in the first. I am the first, the beginning and the very end. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, we read that he is the firstborn from among the dead. In John chapter 17, verse 5, you don't need to turn to this, we won't take time, but the Father in the, or the Son praying to the Father in the high priestly prayer on John 17, he says, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had before with thee, before the world was. And we need to understand, I'm sure nobody here thinks that the Lord Jesus Christ began when he was born of the Virgin Mary. I know a lot of people, uh, I've met a lot of people that did, do believe that. But he was from the beginning. We're going to see more about that later. In the beginning, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God, and that word, the Hebrew word there is Elohim, plural, meaning the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all three persons of the Godhead. So uh, he was before all things, we find. And then also he has the preeminence in power. Verse 16, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Do you know why you were created? Turn to Revelation chapter 4, the book of Revelation chapter 4. I think some of us forget this. Some of us perhaps never, never knew this, but Revelation chapter 4 Verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. You stop and think of that for a moment. You were created, and I was created for God's pleasure. Elsewhere we find we were created for his pleasure and glory. God didn't just create us that we might run wild and do anything we want to do. Our whole life should be wrapped up in Jesus Christ. I was reading this past week about money and, and uh, how gracious God is to allow us uh, to even earn a living. Do you realize, we sing this little song, and we don't think much of it, he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. All right, and, it, and the wealth in every mine, and so on. He owns everything. All right, then the very fact that he allows you to have a little bit of that for a day's work, he doesn't have to. He owns it. Am I coming through to you? We're just stewards. Everything you have, if you're a child of God, belongs to God. And if you refuse to use it for God, you're sinning against God. I don't care whether it's your house, your automobile, you hold back your children. I've known mothers and fathers in this church who have discouraged their children from going to the mission field. That's right. The 
trying. I know people who tried to discourage my own daughter. And it's the same old story. Can't you serve God just as well at home? Not if God called you someplace else you can't. There's no way. There's no way. And you see, God owns all the wealth. It belongs to him. And we need to understand this. And we, we were created for his pleasure. And, I, you know, I stop and think sometimes. I wonder how much pleasure God got out of my life last week or out of me. You think about that. All things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. John chapter 1, verse 3 don't turn, you know it. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, so many times we, we separate. We say that, that the Father he created. In the beginning, the Father he created the heavens and earth. And then the Lord Jesus Christ died. And the Holy Spirit lives in us. Now, I suppose theology-wise, that's correct. Maybe I should reverse that. Practical-wise, that's correct. Theology-wise, it's incorrect. Because there's no way that you can separate the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Different periods of time, one of them was in the forefront. We might say we had the dispensation of the Father. Then we had the dispensation of the Son when he was on earth. Now we're in the dispensation of the Holy Spirit when he indwells the believer and is convicting the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And then we're going to go back into the dispensation of the Father again when the wrath of God is poured out then the Lord Jesus Christ comes back for the Battle of Armageddon Geddon, and the millennial reign. So we could divide things, but it, all it means is that that person of the Godhead was in the forefront. Because there's no way you can separate the Father, Son, and then the, whole, and the Holy Spirit. And we'll see that even more thoroughly in just a few moments. This is the same Christ that God is seeking to save sinners with for the glory of his name. Notice something else. He has a preeminence in verse 17 in his authority. This is, this is so important. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Verse 17. By him all things are held together is really a better translation on it. I like that. The Lord is holding everything together. What do you suppose an astronaut would do if he couldn't depend upon the laws of science? Because everything is in perfect order, our men, scientists, can sit down, they can figure out and say, we're going to put a man on the moon, he's going to land at 2.03 next Tuesday morning. And then a couple of weeks later, we're going to bring him back down in a certain spot in America, and he's going to land at 3.06 in the afternoon. Now, all you'd have to do to follow that up would be one of a million things in outer space or on the earth go wrong. The law of gravity changed just a little bit, or the sun just changed its course a little bit, or the moon at night, or the atmosphere. But you see, the Lord Jesus Christ holds all things together. He's the one. He's the one that spoke the worlds into existence. And everything's in order. We don't think about that. Then you get some of these nuts. 
that they're ignoramuses. You remember what an ignoramus is? That's a man that's educated beyond his intellect. We'll tell you that a, a hump flew off out there, and that's where we all started from. And you know, that's just about as stupid as to take a watch all apart and put it in a box and shake it up. And I say, here, you've got yourself a brand new Elgin watch. Put it on, tell time. And you look at it and you say, all I got is a bunch of pieces. Somebody has got to put that together and make it function properly. It just won't go together alone. This is, this is what these scientists tell us, isn't it? That piece f fell off out there and kept going, evoluted, and finally we lost our tails and we're sitting here today. You know, I can't understand how, a, a, you know, a child could believe something like that. I'll give them one, one credit. I'll give them credit in one area. They tell it so big that nobody in their right mind would believe it. It's such a big lie. Aren't you glad that you and I are, are simple, ordinary, common people? Just imagine being educated so much to believe something like that. And there are people that are. It's sad. It's sad. But we need to realize that all authority, the Lord Jesus Christ has all authority. He has a preeminence in it. Upholding all things, in Hebrews it says, by the word of his power. The whole creation is kept together. Turn, if you will, to 1 Peter chapter 3. You need to see this because there's going to be a time when things are going to be different. Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 10. The day of the Lord. One day the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back. And it won't be the meek and lowly Jesus. He's coming back to take vengeance. Notice. But the day of the Lord, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation or manner of life and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth, dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. So everything is in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And one day, things are going to be made right. One day, all these people going around and pointing their finger and laughing at God and making fun of religion and making fun of God's people and open sin, immorality on every corner. One of these days, there's going to be a payday. And God helped them. In verse 18, we find that the Lord Jesus Christ has a preeminence in the church. He is the head of the body, the church. Oh, my. Here, his preeminence is generally acknowledged. But I wonder, does he get his place in a real practical way? Now, if I were to ask anybody here this morning that's a Christian, I think, who's the head of the church? I think perhaps all of you that have been here very long, at least, would say, Jesus Christ. And then I'd say, is he really? And then we'd all stop and think, wouldn't we? In his word, we have his mind and will concerning us clearly revealed. We understand what the Lord expects of us from the word of God. The secret of the church authority and power lies in obedience to his word, both in doctrine and in practice. When I was meditating upon this portion of scripture, 
the Lord gave me a good illustration. You listen. You take a family, a family of children, and what would you think of a child? You have a child that's grown, that obeyed you right down the line. I mean, you just had no problem with them. You'd say, it's time to go to bed, go to bed. You'd say, I want you home at 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock. I'm going out, I want the lawn mowed, get back, the lawn was mowed. Once you turn the television off, turn the television off. But when that child went out, it kept lousy company. It got with the wrong crowd and got into things. Yet every Sunday morning, that child go to church with you. That child uh, read the Bible. You just, you just couldn't believe. But just this one area of disobedience. Now let me give you an application. What do you suppose our Lord thinks? He's a great preacher of a so-called great church. He preaches the gospel. The church gives the missions. They defend the faith. People are walking the aisles. Then they'll hook up with the ministerial association. Or they'll get into some ecumenical meetings. What do you suppose the Lord thinks? You see what we have here? He's the head. And to demonstrate, there's no way that a child can demonstrate his love for a mom and daddy better than being obedient. The Lord Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now that's simple. If you don't keep them, then you are, are demonstrating you don't love me. And it's the same thing. When some little child or some teenager throws their arms around your neck and says, Daddy, I love you, and they're sneaking around behind your back, they're lying. And when you and I come into an assembly like this and we tell God we love him and then disobey him, you see, we're, we're really telling God that we don't love him. But we want everybody else to think that we are. He's the head of the church. And he must have the preeminence. And... If we really love him, we're going to obey him no matter what it costs. And it'll cost sometimes. Because you're going to hurt somebody's feelings sometimes. And some people aren't going to understand. I know. I mean, I, I know from preachers. I mean, just recently, we uh, I've hurt some feelings because uh, I wouldn't go in with a bunch of preachers on a political situation. Well, I had no more business in a mess like that. God didn't call me to be a politician and to go out and check these fellows. The powers to be are ordained of God. God raised up Hitler. You say, why? For his own pleasure. God raised up Ronald Reagan, whether you voted for him or not. We need to understand we're in the body of Christ and we need to, to keep things where they belong. And when you and I start on crusades, uh, we need to be careful. We need to be very careful because as a child of God, we're to reproduce and reproduce Christians. Well, 
what is displeasing to the head must be displeasing to the body. Back here in Ephesians chapter 1. Galatians, Ephesians chapter 1. We read this. And he has put all things under his feet, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fulfill, that filleth all in all. So it, 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 it's, it's important. It's important that the Lord Jesus Christ Is the head of the body. How about in riches? He has a preeminent in riches in verse 19. In him should all the fullness dwell. What a, a portion of scripture. For it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell. You know what that means? What we are touching on a minute. Ago, the fullness of the Godhead. In the Lord Jesus Christ should all the fullness, God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, should all dwell. The Lord Jesus Christ was filled with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. John chapter 17, I want you to see this. Gospel of John chapter 17, verse 21. John chapter 17, verse 21. This is the Lord Jesus Christ right after the Lord's Supper in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's praying. In fact, this is just before Gethsemane. Chapter 20, verse 21, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me now he's talking about the church, that we all might be one. Then he says, As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, or mature, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and has loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. So the Lord Jesus Christ here, all the fullness dwells in the Lord Jesus Christ. Every bit. And so when we're indwelt with Christ, actually all the fullness of the Godhead is living in us. Now all who are in fellowship with him may be in touch with the fullness of God. In John chapter 1, don't turn, verse 16, And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. The moment you're born again, you receive all the fullness of God. He dwells inside you. But does he have the preeminence? We, we rock along in our own Christian life. And any and all blessings we have received have come out of his fullness. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 26. For the earth is the Lord's, what? And the fullness thereof. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19. Be filled, what? with all the fullness of God. One more portion and we close. Ephesians chapter 4. Now this is God's plan. Ephesians chapter 4 beginning at verse 11. Now here he's referring to the church and he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why? Now, this is important because I think so many pastors today think that God has given them that they ought to be a clown. 
All you need to do is just pick up the morning paper or the, or the paper that has all the church advertisements and read what's in them. Just last week, uh, some pastor uh, going to ride to town, ride to church that Sunday morning on a jackass. Well, I'm sure riding down the street, some people are looking, wondering which was which. But this is supposed to attract people coming in and to get people. Now, now, God didn't give anything like that. And some of them were going to have a clown. I think I told you about the church over in Tampa. They had a gorilla. Now, let's, let's understand this because we're all prone to be entertained. We like to be entertained. And, and we like to see what's, what's playing at the local church. You know, they, they're going to have some real high-powered quartet. Or they've got some uh, football player there that, oh, he just crushes them. But he's going to come and give his testimony, you know. And uh, we, we have these uh, star attractions. And the star attraction ought to be the Word of God. Because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word. And the Apostle Paul made it clear that it wasn't enticing words or wasn't some clever thing that he said, but he came in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. All right. The Apostle Paul here is saying, God gave to the church some apostles. Remember the Apostle Paul said that he was an apostle by the will of God. Oh, he was proud of it. I'm not an apostle because... Some bunch of people laid empty hands on an empty head and ordained me. No, he says, I'm an apostle by the will of God. Some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. Now, why? For the perfecting of the saints. Notice that. Not the entertaining of the goats. That's what we got in so many churches. Bring the unsaved and bring them in. Then we have nine spatial numbers and put this little show on and then after we think uh, we, we've got them about half asleep someone comes up and gives a little message now don't you get mad at me you get mad at God this is what he says for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ beloved if you don't get ministered to in the Word, if you don't get your feet stomped on occasionally, pretty often, more than occasionally, and get pricked with the Word of God, there's something wrong. You're going the wrong place. Because I'm too old to run a popularity contest. So you see what my responsibilities? Till we all come in the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Now, beloved, if more of this was preached and preached like God says to preach, you wouldn't have all the splits in the churches you have nowadays. There wouldn't be a, a 50th many Baptist churches as there are now. Or Assemblies of God or anybody else church. You don't like what's going on? We'll just go out and start a new one. Start a new one. Start a new one. But that isn't God's intention. God says that the Word of God ought to bring us together in unity. Till we come together, come in the unity of faith and the knowledge of God, the Son of God, unto a perfect or a mature man. Under the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children. You see, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. I remember years ago when we had an attack of Jehovah Witnesses here. And I taught you people. And then I, I, I went to one of their meetings. They were holding a meeting in one of our ladies' churches, down, in one of our houses down there. And I said, uh, what am I going to do? They're coming. I said, I'll come down provided you never open up your home again. I went down, and uh, we backed them against the wall. 
I mean, they got so mad at me that they finally turned, one of them turned to the lady of the house and said, if this were my home, I'd throw him out. She says, no, I invite him and he stays. And I, and I held him right to the line. And you know, after that, all you had to do around here, and some of you old timers will say, someone wrapped in your door, just say, I'm from the Rifle Range Baptist Church, and they just turned tail and left. They didn't want to mess around with anybody in the Rifle Range. They knew that we knew better. We knew about them. And that comes because people are taught. You ought to know how you believe about divorce. You ought to know how you believe about and what the Bible teaches about adultery. The second coming of Jesus Christ, fornication, lying, stealing. You ought to know about these things, and you ought to know what God says about these things. And then when they come up in your life or come up in some thing that you're connected with, there's no problem. You know what's right and you know what's wrong. And you don't have to stand there and say, well, I'm not sure. You ought to be sure when somebody does something wrong. But notice that we no longer be t tossed to and fro. This is why churches split. Is because people, now listen to me, people take sides rather than taking sides with God. Someone gets a little click over here and someone gets a little click over here. And the phone starts buzzing. And if the pastor had properly taught those people He'd have them on their knees, and things would be straightened out. Now, folks, I know the devil is listening, but I know something else, too. I've been here 20, almost 26 years, and any of you who've been here very long knows that we haven't had anything that even looked like a split. And it's all the glory of God, because you people know we've had to vote out. I remember one time when we had to vote out a deacon You people stood by, side by side. I've seen some of you dear women with tears stringing down your face. Vote your husbands out. That's right. Why? Because you were taught in the Word of God. It isn't that you don't love somebody. It's that you love God more. And this is what we have here. They're not carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive you. The world is full of them out here. This charismatic movement, all this bit, trying to deceive you and get you carried away. Now look, but speaking the truth in love may grow up. God says, grow up, be mature unto him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Here it is. The Lord Jesus Christ must have the preeminence in our life. But you and I must realize that when we're coming here, it should be just like coming uh, when you sit down at, at Thanksgiving dinner. You don't sit down there to go on a fast. Anything but. You sit there and you look over and you... Ooh, and, you, and, you, and you, you feel begin to kind of feel bad because you haven't got enough room here to hold what your mind says you want. So you've got to kind of allot it or else suffer all afternoon. And when you come to a church, it ought to be the same thing if you're a child of God. You ought to come expecting your heart and your soul to be fed. And if it hasn't been fed, you've been gypped. If you haven't had some correction, or been admonished, or just been blessed in the Word of God, or been taught some things you didn't know, that there's something wrong. Now, if you got mad, that's good. Because the Word of God will do that sometimes. Mike, come and sing, would you please?